Hey, what's going on? It is Misa, and today I'm going to be talking about my cosplay and also be showing you my time at the Grand Rapids Comic Con Spring Fling. Okay, so first of all, I want to apologize about the Death Note series that I did. That was the first series that I've ever done on my channel, and the sound quality isn't the best. I was experimenting with different audio messages, and some of it I was a little depressed. <laughs> So I apologize about that. Anywho, so this is my cosplay that I wore to Grand Rapids Spring Fling. I'm just showing it to you a little bit up close. I didn't really show it too much in the Comic-Con video that I showed because I was mostly just walking around. And so this is it. I have the little lacy arms. This is my, oh, Misa cosplay, of course. I'm pretty sure who else would I be in Death Note? So these are the lacy sleeves. I decided to do like a corset top like this, and then I have a little roughly skirt. I don't worry, I'm wearing shorts underneath here because I'm definitely not walking around Comic-Con with just the, this little frilly skirt thing on. <laughs> but especially if I'm gonna be sitting for long periods of time. And then I'm wearing the little garters, just like Misa is, right here. They're so cute, they have little hearts on them. Can I show you? Ah, uh, looks like I'm about to show you my tattoo. Yep, there we go. And then I have the little, no, oh, there's my tattoo, little lacy bottoms, or lacy, I guess you can call them tights. <laughs> and for the shoes, I don't feel like putting my foot up here, I have these little boots, the little chunky boots, and it was fun wearing these to Comic-Con. Well, I felt extremely tall because they're like three inches, so I'm like five, well, I'm not like, I'm five foot four and a half. So I was about five, seven and a half. So that was a new experience for me. I was walking around kind of being like super tall and I was making sure I was standing up straight. So, which I don't know, kind of didn't really help because it felt like everybody else was the same height <laughs> in the video. And I do want to warn you though, in this video, I kind of, okay, I did kind of, I was gifted new mics, and they were the cute little mics that you clipped onto your shirt, like interview mics. I've seen some amazing reviews for them. I tested them out, and they actually worked pretty good on my computer. So I was like, great, these are gonna work out great. Uh, my camera, perfect. And I don't know if it was because we were in a room and it was echoey, it could have been, but the quality isn't the best. I wish I switched over to a different microphone when it became time for the panel, for the Death Note panel. <laughs> ah! Because you can hear my cousin and the audience talking. And I forgot to zoom in, so that's my fault. I feel like a freaking idiot. I know this is my first Comic-Con of the year, so please excuse me. <laughs> I feel stupid. I feel stupid. I should have been more prepared. If I get a dislike for this video, I completely understand. <laughs> I should have been more prepared. And the cosplay competition was a bunch of baloney. You know how every cosplay competition, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know every cosplay competition that I've ever been to, they always walk on the stage and present their cosplay to the judges. Well, I thought I had amazing seats. So I was perfect. I was between two heads because we didn't get front row. We got second row. And... Then all of a sudden, they started walking in front of us, and I'm like, wait, where is this person going? And they just stood right in front of me, way in the corner, in front of this X, and I couldn't even see them. So we got horrible seats for the cosplay competition, and it was a bunch of baloney. And then my camera started dying, so it was a bunch of crap. So <laughs> I... Uh, and that frustrated me so much because the cosplay competition is my favorite. <sighs> but please enjoy this video for what it is. Um, yeah. But there are some good parts in here, so please keep watching. Um, let me know if there's another series you want to try. I will be testing out some new microphones. So let me know if there's anything else you would like to see from me. All right.
So please enjoy this video. Hey, it's Misa, and I am filming at the Grand Rapids Spring Fling. And I hope you can hear me okay. It is a lot of noise in here. And unfortunately, my sister was, it, well, she is sick. So I have another special guest with me. And it is... Jackie! <laughs> I hope you can hear us okay, because we have a new mic, so they're uh, connected to our chest. So let's get this day started at 1 p.m. today. The Death Note panel is going to be, and we are going to be there as close as we possibly can. So let's get this day started. Woohoo! <laughs> look at all those book bags. Ooh, Jackie, look. These are cute. <laughs> oh, it's my life. I just saw that, yeah. These are great. What are these? Some artwork? Shoulder to shoulder. I don't really see any death metal people here, which is kind of surprising. Oh, look at they got tails here. I see tails. I see tails. Ooh. Do you need to get cat ears? Does this go into my purse? Does this go into my purse? Does this go into my purse? Look at these. Do these go into my bag? I think $30 for this one. $30? I don't think so. Oh, wow. I don't think I can do this for $30. So we're at the Death Note panel right now. And I'm like seeing like two Misa's and like three lights. Um, with Jen. Um, yes. Um, yes. And I. I cried this okay. morning. I my love it. Crown broke. Yeah, it, it really did. Yeah. So that's why she's not walking around with her staff. Yeah. But I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me give you a little scope of the room. People look at staring at me right now. I'm probably wondering what the heck I'm doing. But yeah, there's like two pieces here. Like, I don't see any reeds right now. Like, uh, I don't see any elves here. I don't want to take a picture with somebody. Um, pretty bad. Glover in second row, though. Brett Swim and Alessandro Giuliani. We got mics for everybody! Oh, with the green shirt. Oh, check, check. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the main introduction out of the way, but why don't you uh, just go down the road here and see yourself your, uh, you know, your, your brief uh, introduction, biography, so on and so forth for all the lovely people here. Hi, everybody. My name is Alessandro Giuliani. I'm the voice of L. Among other things. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Brad Swale, um, voice actor from Vancouver, Canada, and I play White, uh, among other things. <laughs> <laughs> He's all jacked up on Apple. That's a great <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alright, so I really cool thing up to see with all of you guys today. I I'm really curious how the process of you guys getting involved in these characters started. Um Death Note was a really instrumental show for a lot of people. Um so the time that it came out, I feel like Death Note for a lot of people was either the first, like, quote unquote, grown up anime they watched, or a lot of people that did grow up with anime, was their first exposure that 
there was more to anime than your typical Dragon Ball kind of shonen show. And I think that made a, a big influence for a lot of people. So how did the, the journey of Death Note start for you guys? Another gig. <laughs> As performers, we uh, we were all at the time right, working on multiple different projects. It's not the only thing we've done. Of course, AJ works a lot of film, TV, Brad and I a lot of like, voiceover. So when the auditions come in, you just look at another one and go, I don't know what this is. I had heard of it. And in fact, uh, the Coles notes, the short version of my story was, I was never given review to read. Um, they'll sometimes the producers will send the dialogue. We call them sides to the performers for the characters they want you to read. And I was sent to uh, Mike's dad and a couple of the other detectives, some other roles, which I prepared, went into the audition, but sometimes they don't like to provide the images of the characters in advance through email in case it gets disseminated somehow and word gets on what show you're working on. So I didn't even know what any would love life except that they were all human. There were no aliens or anything that I was aware of. Until I showed up to the audition, they posted pictures of the characters on the wall that you'd be auditioned for. I saw all these characters, and I thought, there's my guy, there's my guy. Whoa! Who's this evil looking <laughs> 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 Who's this guy? And but I didn't have any signs for him, so I wasn't asked to read. Went into audition, and Carl, who was a phenomenal uh, voice director of Ocean Studios, I asked him, can I read for the creepy looking demon guy out there as well? I said, oh, yeah, no problem. He's so laid back. Here are the signs, go take five minutes, check it out. So I didn't really prepare much. Maybe that was how I got it. I didn't have time to get in my head about choices for him. And I said, anything I should know? And he just said, he's not the bad guy. You might think just from the image, he's not the demon, villain, you know, killing people bad guy. He's not what you think. So don't play that side of it. And he's got a bit of a weird laugh. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> so come in in a couple minutes and do your thing. And I did. I didn't get any other parts, but I got for you. So there you go. Uh, yeah. Um, for me, yeah, I mean, I was marginally familiar with Death Note. I knew that it was popular in Japan, and the little that I did know about it at the time, I I, I imagined it was going to be popular in North America. Um, I've been working on an anime series for quite some time, and this was one that I'm like, well, this is a little bit different. It's not Sailor Moon, it's not Pokemon. Um, it's something that, that could be quite special. Turns out it really, really has been very special. But for me, the audition for Death Note was unlike anything that I had auditioned for before. And we work on a lot of freely uh, North American cartoons where the cartoon has not been created when you're auditioning for it. So you usually get maybe a handful of lines from episode one. You'll read that, and then if you get you're cast in that particular show, you'll record how many episodes, how many seasons. But because Death Note was already produced, uh, they had dialogue from all 37 episodes in one page of size, the audition size, like we call them. And it's very rare when you go for an audition where the first line and the last line are complete polar opposites for a character. So the beginning of the page was lines from episode one, and by the end of that one eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, it was maniacal laughter and <laughs> And I saw that. I need to get on this show. <laughs> and, you know, you can see this incredible story arc all laid out on one page. And I was very fortunate that uh, when I did my reading, I was cast as, as Light. It's, you know, obviously become one of my favorite shows that I've got to work on. And the idea that we originally recorded the English tracks for the show in 2007, 2008, and we're still discussing it today like it's a brand new show. And over the years, I could say decades now, practically, um, it's been discovered and rediscovered by so many different groups of people that it's, it still feels fresh, it still feels relevant. And it's amazing how many people, like you were to, have said, this is the show that got me into watching anime. And I'm not sure if my response is supposed to be, well, you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome, and I'm sorry. <laughs> you were not just fortunate to get that role. You were the perfect role for that psychopath. <laughs> Barely any acting involved in my part. I'm just. <laughs> uh, you know we we do a lot of shows uh, individually. We've been in other shows together. Uh, 
animated cartoons, whatnot. Um, it's a they're not all death notes. And and the thing about death notes that I'm you know I'm continuing to discover there's a rare like alchemy in what we do that we can't really explain. Um, I'm pretty sure that when I came into audition for Death Note, I probably read for Light. I don't remember, but I probably read for Light. I probably read for Matsuda. I probably I may have even read for you, although it wasn't really in my wheelhouse at the time. To be honest, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, yes, yeah. Uh, but things when, when a show hits, when a show is great, which I think Death Note is. Uh, it's because things seem to have fallen into the right place. Like, I think it was brilliant casting that Brad was light, and not just because he's a sociopath and light, <laughs> uh, because he delivered a performance that I wouldn't have, or Brian wouldn't have. And I didn't know anything about the show. I had hardly done any anime before Death Note. I came in totally fresh, and for whatever reason, maybe that was why, when I did my audition, it was something a little different. It was something uh, that struck the director's ears, the cast of people's ears, and it was in some way kind of meant to be, I think, that we ended up in the roles that we were. It was a good fit, and that's why the show was good. If I really liked the show better, it was good, we might not all be here. <laughs> <laughs> this was the project we're going to do next, is death note musical chairs. It's all the guys, exactly same thing, we all switch roles, yeah. and we can do it all over again. I always wanted to play Visa. You always wanted to cosplay Visa. Come on, that's what <laughs> So I wanted to say, I thought this was really interesting. Um, uh, you find some really bizarre stuff when you're doing research these sort of, sort of panels. Uh, talking about, um, Reddit talked about being excited for this role, but on your IMDb page, there's a quote that you have from the Death Note uh, DVD box. Paraphrase a bit here, and it just says, I didn't get cast with villains very often. My very first uh, cartoon was My Little Pony Tales in 1992, and I was the quote unquote bad pony. <laughs> <laughs> but, sorry. but that's a bad guy, but you know, not bad as far as ponies go. <laughs> okay, so first of all, that was not 1982. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry. Right. So, yeah, so that was actually my very first audition for a cartoon, because I started off. Doing theater, and then I was doing on-camera work for like you know film and TV commercials and things. And then I had an audition for a cartoon, and I thought, oh, that's really cool. And it was a show called My Little Pony Tales, and I got it. And so I was a pony. And yeah, in hindsight, there was only three boy ponies on that whole show, and I was kind of a bad pony as far as ponies are concerned. <laughs> he, he was a little bit mean to some of the girls from time to time, and he was a little self-indulgent, whatever. Um, so yeah, I was a badass pony. <laughs> Again, as far as ponies are concerned. Which I want to now the fact that I've seen several pieces of fan art of White Yankee as a pony. Now I'm going to like Oh, that's awesome. I love that. You don't get that world, so you can think about this in Polyon. There was a convention, and it was around Halloween. I want to say it was in Michigan, um, several years ago. And I decided that I was, because it was Halloween, I'm a huge Halloween nerd, so I fit into the. Yeah! Halloween! You were on the death note panel of like Halloween. <laughs> So, I mean, there was, I think it was the same show one year where Halloween was on Sunday, so I brought three costumes. So I was Indiana Jones on Friday, I was Han Solo riding a Tauntaun on Saturday, where I channeled my inner Jim Henson for that costume. Pretty impressive. And then I was Ash for People Dead on Sunday. So, yeah! And, and so I think this might have been the following year or something, and I decided that I was going to do another Halloween costume. But one that there's no way I would go trick or treating in. It was specifically for a convention, and I dressed up as Pizza Pony from My Little Pony. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I performed a song, I got my car with me, and I, I didn't think about it at the time. So I'm like, I do a panel, I'll show up in my costume, it's just a solo That's panel. Cool. I'm like, oh, I'll bring my guitar and I'll play a song too. Not thinking that people would record it. 
And it would end up on the internet. And it's very confusing to people like, why is this guy dressed as a phobia? <laughs> Singing like a 60 song or something. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's cool that the deck up show you guys so much room to play with. Like, 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 life almost feels like playing five different characters throughout the, the course of the show, and Al is just this unique take on this sort of Sherlock's more Moriarty relationship. And Ryu is, I think the thing I like about it is that he's probably the mainly most straightforward person in the show. Like, he's the guy that shows up day one, is like, you cannot trust me, I don't work for you, and at the end of the show, I am going to kill you. And he does this. And he shows up liars and deceivers, most honest person to death, God. And that's the best part. Uh, love yeah. is equal. Death is equal. <laughs> Like, I mean, the thing that works with L for me is I love this idea of character creation where you can just take uh, like just one very unique attribute added on to something and it immediately becomes something different. Like, the fact that plot-wise, the fact that um, L is a dessert connoisseur kind of doesn't really change anything, but it's like the number one thing you think of when people talk about the character or when things are put together. Um, and it's just a small thing, but compared to the shows that stood out when we were watching the show recently, is how well you did with the numerous times where he was doing lines while eating. <laughs> like, so many people don't fake that very well. And every time, like, oh, I should be very clear with what he's saying. I did not fake it at all, actually. The thing, uh, one thing you guys might not know is that we're kind of discovering the show in, in real time almost as if we're watching it too, because we would get an episode maybe a week before, maybe just a few days before, uh, to prep for recording. So I was discovering all these fun things about Hell as we went along. When he first appeared and he was just on the screen, I didn't really know what he looked like or what his physicality was going to be or what his quirks were going to be. And as they slowly were revealed to me, I began to uh, understand how much fun it was going to be to voice him. In terms of the eating, uh, when I discovered that that was an excuse to like uh, have sweets, I brought pastries into the studio, uh, donuts, cakes, and so every eating moment that you uh, hear is real. I'm sacrificing for my are you? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really it's the only time I've been happy uh, was in Hell's eating. I'm sure for most of those lines, they were happy with take one. And you're like, let me do four or five more takes, it's delicious. I think that's like an hour of a lemon meringue line. Let's do some chocolate. I think it'll be stickier. It's a big part of the show. You've got the cakes and the chips and the apple. I'm telling you, it's like everything you need for a healthy meal. It's so made for people with the munchies. What is your favorite cake and chip? That's the kind of question. It's like, who's your favorite child? <laughs> but, you know, I'll be honest. I, I'm a connoisseur of the potato chip. I was before that note. I just appreciate it more now. Uh, so I like, I like most potato chips. You know, I'll, the, the you know, old fashioned regular, nothing wrong with that. Sour cream and onion is probably my huckleberry. Uh, barbecue is always good. Yeah. Okay. Which ones do I not like? So oh, you're best salt and pepper chips. Your ketchup chips. They don't know what I'm talking about. They don't, they don't have you don't get ketchup chips down here, and they're not my favorite. But I will steer clear of the salt and vinegar. Not my bad. But pretty much everything else, I will devour. <laughs> okay, I'm a fan of steel apples. Yes, favorite apple. Not the usual red delicious. They're garbage. Who eats a red delicious apple? Garbage. Get your eyes open. I do, I do. Yeah. Granny yeah. Smith. They're beautiful for the photographs. <laughs> not here. Not here. What is the best apple then? Oh, you know what? I think I have um, this is called Sun Crisp, but the rainy birds look really great. I do mostly like a red apple, but it has a little bit of tart to it. Granny Smith, too much. Red Delicious, too starchy. I think that's a good one. But in general, you have one to go to, like, is there a lot of like, there was a bakery right down the street from the studio, so I'd pop in there every day, do my name by the end of the recording session. 
And I would cook the rest of the dinner. They had little waffle kind of pastries, off them with chocolate and Nutella in them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I like, sometimes I go savory, but very rarely, you know, depend. You know, it's Death Note is very interesting because because of the premise very specifically, it does make certain of your usual go-to interview questions a little bit difficult for you like, in what ways are you like your character? No. How hard is your character? No. But I like I thought you were speaking with um, the impact of the show as time goes on. I think that is something that's really interesting about the show. Then when you watch it, like there's yeah, whether it's not a specific thing, there definitely is a sense of feel like sometimes you're like, wow, watching Death Note again after X happens, now this hits a little bit differently, one way or the other, as time's gone on. At this point, it's been 17 years since the original show came out, 20 from when the anime came out, from when the manga was originally released. And like I said, so much of the show and its themes and all that still hold up today, and it's really cool to see people so excited for it, and how they went with it, and how you guys have worked with these characters and worked together with all of that. Um, but also you guys talk about the fact that you guys worked on other projects together with each other. Um, I know one that I actually didn't know was both of you, um, two of you, was you guys both worked on um, Zoid Zero Century, where um, as um, Harry Champ and uh, Cisco uh, which were actually two of my favorite characters on that show. It's an interesting comparison, like Harry Champ kind of thing, as he has like all the confidence of like Yaku, who is complete Cooper, instead of being, you know, this charismatic mastermind. I guess he is. <laughs> Cooper, bring it around. <laughs> the other way we worked out together too, Brad and I did a lot of those together back in the day. Pre, pre death though. And we've been doing this for a stretch and a long time. <laughs> and it's, it's funny because like there's probably you know, episode-wise, we've been on a lot of shows together. But the amount of time that we've been in the studio at the same time, uh, comparatively, is, is pretty small. Um, you know, we've worked, worked on a lot of the same shows, but you know, for, for the anime series, they bring in one after a time. So we might do 52 episodes of the Gundam series, and I might not know that, uh, you know, rising dead. And so later the day before we flew down here, um, I was standing outside the studio, as Brad was inside the studio, working on a new preschool show, which we're probably not allowed to talk about yet, but Brad, voices were coming out of Brad that no one here would believe it's the same guy line, and then I go in with these goofy, silly uh, characters that are from, like, four and under. Uh, and then actually AJ's on the show as well, we play a bunch of guest roles on this new preschool show, which once it comes out, we'll be allowed to talk about it. Here's another incredible follow The room will be filled with crying babies. Right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, and, and that's something where pre pandemic, we would have all been in the same room yeah. recording with our own microphones at the same time. But because things had to you know, adapt and adjust uh, during lockdowns and whatnot, we're still at the point where they're bringing one actor at a time, uh, which is just. You know, something that's not uncommon for us because we've worked on that many before, but for a lot of actors, it's something that's very strange. They don't have actors in their room to play on. Well, we've been doing that for years um, and relying on, you know, amazing direction and great animation that's uh, in front of us. So, Alessandro, what have your kind of experience been going back and forth between live action and um, voice acting recording and kind of the differences that come with that? Um, I love doing it both. I love doing it all. Um, in this industry, it helps a ton to have, uh, you know, a lot of options <laughs> because sometimes one particular aspect of your career will be, you know, fallow for a while, and you need to go to rotate your crops and go around. Using a farming metaphor, I don't know it's terrible. Sometimes you need barley. Sometimes you need wheat. Um, uh, so I love going back and forth. I think it sort of keeps me on my toes. It makes me a better actor because I'm using different aspects of my personality and my skill set. Um, someone was asking me in, uh, in the line for autographs today about the difference. And I, I said, you know, um, being on camera, working in film and TV is a lot like sprinting. It's a sprint. Um, you wait a long time and then you act for 30 seconds. And it's got to be precise, and you've got to hit your mark, 
and you've got to know what you're doing, the seat you're going to be up, and then you wait around around? again for another five hours, and then you have to go again <laughs> for four minutes, you know. So there's an intensity to it that is cool. I thought you think it was um, cute. But I love that I don't just I'll do delete that. that. Sorry. It sure. would be enough to kind of be excited to just do that. I do a lot of live performance and theater, and that's a bit more like a marathon. You have to pace yourself. You have to be able to make it from A to Z every night, uh, seven shows a week. Uh, you got to stay healthy. It's a sort of different lifestyle. Hey, yeah. That's that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're from Vancouver. Uh, and, uh, and then voice is kind of the cherry on top because voice, um, you know, it requires the least personal hygiene. Uh, and it can be, especially when we were all in the room together, it was the most fun because it was all of us together trying to crack each other up. You know, usually it's not too serious a show that we're all in a room uh, together with. And it was a ton of fun. The dirtiest jokes always come up during the preschool shows. I don't know why. It's just life is about balance. You know, originally when I was going to do this panel, I had I was going to tell some sort of a joke about how there, there's an interesting bit about, because of the context of this specific show, that more than likely you guys over the years have had people either make or buy their own death notes and then ask you to sign them, only to get here today to realize that at least two of you have your own death notes and your tables, for, for the sake, like, it's, there's a Something about the superstition of that, I just find very hilarious. Okay, I got a story uh, along those lines. So we were recording Death Note, and it, it was being released, but we were still working. We hadn't gone through the whole series. And I was invited to a convention. They're like, okay, yeah, I've come down one of these places now, so I'll go do it. And then day one, somebody comes up to me with a Death Note. They're like, oh, yeah, this is perfect and great, right? Yes, it's going to be signed. No, I love that. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. And in my head, I was just seeing like animated news headlines. You know, voice actor in Death Note series, sitcom studio, like some random crazy event before <laughs> finishing the series. And like, in my head, I'm like, they have to recast and then see something else. <laughs> it's going to be great. But now we just said, I'm like, terrible story. I'm like, that's just ironic, not cool. So I didn't sign my name, I signed a fake name. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not a superstitious guy, except. I'm a superstitious guy. <laughs> Instead of signing sign Brad Swale, I signed Braggadocio Swale. Oh, I like that. And then cross out some of the letters. And I did that right until the last day of recording was done. And once we finished the series, I'm like, yeah, I made it. And now I can actually sign the letters. Oh, but gosh. I was, I was, I, I looked very much like light in that moment because I think I was all like, here we go. And then I was like, <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, from now on, I'm calling you back to this It's something you have like a French alter ego with a handlebar mustache across the Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a little bit of a bossy. I'm going to show you. The regular show is actually a topic. I had to find a word quickly that, like, what has all the letters of my name, like, is actually my name. And, you know. Yeah. And then I was stuck with that until the show. I don't mind your sure what's spelling this right, but I live. Yeah. I'm glad you don't find a workaround that works for you. I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, Sandro, I'm curious with, um, with the role of L, you had a bit more of a, at least a range of strength compared to the other two, where L didn't get the opportunity to be as bombastic and crazy. As, um, as the other two did. So with the more subdued character like that, how do you find the the, the, the smaller levels in there to make it work? Um, well, for one thing, I was grateful for it. Like, often when you come out of the studio, your throat is like sore, bleeding, screaming, or you know, if you're doing a Lego show, or video games are the worst because all of it is. <laughs> so L was super nice on on the on the throat and yeah, pastry and then uh, yeah I got some pastry. Uh, game you now no I mean uh, yeah I mean I would find a range within that um, 
there were so many eccentricities and so many uh, revelations about the character that it was never, I was never worried about it sort of becoming one dose because the show itself, the way it was written and constructed, it was constantly sort of dropping these little treats for the audience about him <laughs> and about his past. And so I had no concerns that people wouldn't be uh, interested or fascinated in him. And, you know, you just figure out a way to, within that very small dynamic range, to find the, the, the art and the scope. Um, it actually wasn't that much of a challenge. It was fun. Well, I'm glad it worked so well for you. I feel like in a lot of ways, L was really like the, the heart of the, the show in a lot of ways, where it is this show so just completely surrounded to come with corruption and whatnot, and L is sort of this um, this light fun mindset. <laughs> Easy there, is yeah. um, You know, um, no, no, it was the very first show that um, you know, like that ended up watching together when we met. And she was watching it for the first time, and she, I did ask her for permission before I told this story that uh, when we got to the thing that happened in episode 25, that she just started falling um, because your character meant so much to her. And um, I really appreciate um, all of you watching that performance. All three of you, it was um, re watching it was pale my third time watching through the show. And I just, watching all three of you just devour the scenery <laughs> in the best way. Because it finds this balance where it never has that, like, anime jump the shark moment. Yeah. Like, you all kind of get that moment to be a little bit more out there, but there is a groundness that pulls the show yeah. back. Um, even to the bitter end, like, um, Light's final... Branch was one of my favorite performances I've ever seen in the show. And the fact that you could go so over the top of it, it still never felt like it was going to break. Even to the extent that, like, <laughs> obviously this isn't up to you, this is a frame, but he's literally in the middle of that monologue, and there's a moment where, of all the frames, he's just posed like, like this. <laughs> and I don't know why they chose that pose. Very flexible. <laughs> he's, he's good at, you know, pretending to swim on the ground in his own blood, too. <laughs> and I love that, like, Ryu is just the guy eating the popcorn for the show. Like, I'm ready to see how this is all going to go. That's part of that role. Just going in. And because we don't want to just be, uh, AJ talked about we only got the script. So, sorry, before, I didn't mind that at all. Sometimes you want to know where it's going. But because of you, was a character that, that literally lives in the, the popcorn eating, the apple eating zone. Of, yeah. Where is this going to go today? <laughs> and just watch and be interesting and see that happen to this and be concerned about some choices. It was it's fun that I could just sort of let them play a scene and go, oh, how I react to the scene is probably going to be just how you does it, right? It's, it's great. Right, just this idea of like having a show where a character has like this big red button in front of them that they just press that button. Yeah. It was fixing absolutely everything. And they're like, nah. Well, you're like, nope. That's fine. Oh boy. <laughs> and it seems like the, the apocalyptic consequences of the show, the fact that all of that started to get where you got bored yeah. and just decided to do oops and then yeah. cause an apocalypse. Yeah, well, that's a, it's such a great first series for people that sort of say they it was first anime. It's not too long. It's not jumping into a thousand episodes of One Piece. It's, <laughs> and right off episode one, you're you're in it. Yeah. You know, you're you're 20 minutes in, going, I gotta watch the next one because now you know it doesn't take four, or five, six episodes to warm up, so you lose the viewer. You're right in from episode one. Yeah, and I think a lot of people who, who come to my tables, um, you know, it, it seems like it's a show that, like you said, it's their first anime or maybe their second or someone showed it to them and it got them into it. Uh, often it's like a middle school show or a high school show. I think it's there's something about the show too that uh, through childhood, things have been a little bit more kind of black and white, like uh, 
you know, good guys and bad guys, and it's all pretty clear, you know, in your sort of early Disney upbringing, or Barbie upbringing, pardon me. Um, and then as you get a little older, you're looking for something with a little more complexity, and that film provides that. It's, it works in those shades of gray and the moral ambiguity of it, and uh, for, a, for a preteen or a teen audience, I think that must be one of the things that hooks them in. Is uh, well, it's not as kind of dry as maybe we thought in our earlier entertainments. Something that is also seemingly fairly unique to this particular series because I have a lot of people that, that come up to me and talk about how they watch this series as a family. And there's not a lot of shows, you know, you know, some of the other series that I work on, you know, somebody will come up with their kid and say, "Oh, my kid loved this when they were whatever age." Or whatever. And with Death Note, I'll see a lot of parents and children. That have both watched it, or maybe the, the child watched it first and then convinced their parents to watch it, and now they watch it together every year around Halloween or something like that. And there's not a lot of series that you can have as much investment from you know a parent and a child um, at the same time. And now that you know, you're saying we're what 17 years oh, away from us having okay. recorded in English, okay. you now have people that are growing up to the point where you know, maybe they had young kids, and now those kids, they're going to be sharing death note with those kids as they become teenagers and onward. And yet, we're still having the same discussions now about morality and ethics related to the series as we did when it first came out. It seems like that's something that's not going to go away because there is no right wrong answer. There's just discussions, and when you have, you know, and sometimes you have families that, that have very little in common uh, with various members of their household. If they can find something like Death Note to get them talking about, even if it's just you know ambiguous terms and, and these like lofty idealistic ideas and whatnot, it's still a conversation, and that's very exciting to have a small part in a series that, that's touched so many families in different ways. And we get to hear one great thing about some of these events: we get to hear all these stories. We get to you know see the aftermath of uh, the effect of a show like Death Note, and that's very rewarding for us as performers and just as human beings. It's amazing. You guys are awesome. Woo. I think that might be why that really is always such like um it's a very common like first recommended anime for a lot of people. Um partially because um for a lot of people who did grow up with anime, it's something that like is outside of what, what a lot of the preconceptions are. It's short enough that people can get through the entire thing in like a short amount of time. Um and also, just the idea, like you said, like how a lot of the themes were so universal and so many people get different things out of it. Where um, when you're watching, there's nothing like watching for the very first time and not knowing all the answers. Where, you know, at the end of episode one, you're already at, like, I will be the god of this new world. And you're like, where do we go from here? Like, this feels like it's like something that. A character would be at the end of the show when they come to look at conclusion like this. And then this unbelievable cat and mouse game begins. And you run into things like the um, the memory loss arc, which I feel like in a normal show that'd be like a half an episode happening, but like that goes on for a while. Then you're playing this completely different, like actually kind of altruistic version of life, and then when you snap back again, you're like, oh, no. Yeah. You almost double down, doubles down at that point, right? So, like, oh, okay, well now let's bring up the pace a little bit. And just, you hear so much of like, people talking about how, like, you know, like, I can listen to these characters read the phone book or whatever. Watching you two in the tennis match. <laughs> That's one of my favorite goals. That's one of my favorite episodes of the whole thing. Okay. Didn't drop. That whole episode, I'm just like, yeah, it just comes out of nowhere too. That the uh, sort of all of a sudden, it's like they're in a you know college movie or something. Like there's this sort of, oh, one's not like the other, but they really get along. Maybe they'll be buddies. And um, it's I just I love it all. Oh, yeah, that was a great reveal and the super intense tennis match. Uh, was a great sort of uh, accent on it all, for sure. And the fact that with that funny comedy thing, you guys literally did the like, chitting together thing, and then we're not too. And the question is, you can't get it for any of you, so.
each other where it, one gets punched and one gets pulled far. Yeah. You know, sort of Couches flying, yeah, that's awesome. And like the, the tennis match, I mean, there's a lot of things that we love about anime. Obviously, we're here. Um, and the anime Sorry. scene is incredible. That tennis match scene is a very tricky scene to navigate from an art point of view, matching it up with the dialogue. Because there's what's happening on the court and then what's happening in the heads. And the way that it was done was just so brilliant. Uh, it was a, a really fun scene to record because we kind of got to see it play out in real time. Uh, and you know, watching it back, it's just it's very well done. And anytime you get to work on it, a show that's well thought out, well constructed, and looks beautiful, um, it's it's an amazing experience. Yeah, totally good sign. Well, since we're kind of talking about favorite scenes, before we move to Q and A, I would kind of like to know from you guys what was like your favorite takeaway moment from the show or something that you could have. A scene or something from the show that you, that you find it really sticks with you. It's always a, a good one, but I mean, we had done it it's a while ago when we did the show, so to try and pull memories, the memories that always tend to be the strongest for me as a performer on most shows, um, unless something really unusual happens in the studio. Our first episodes, because it's brand new, you're a little bit your, 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 your senses are heightened, you're a little bit excited, it's your first episode on anything. So to do that very first episode, which is a really fun one for you, uh, of course, because it was from the death row to drop the note and, and first encounter with light. That is a memory, and then of course, for me, it always is the last episode as well. Because you know it's the final one, so you have a few more moments with the director, you're wrapping up the series, and there's some really interesting moments of course, from you at the end of the series as well. So those are the two that stand out the strongest. And then, of course, a couple, I always know there's a couple of fun sequences in the middle with the apple. Um, just the, when he goes crazy a few times and he's flipping around and just talks about the withdrawals. Yeah, going to withdrawals. And, you know, I remember those being silly because I didn't know they were coming until you get there. I'm like, oh, he's really goofy here. And we can sort of hide this up a little bit and come out of the, the sort of, you know, uh, depth got bored and wondering what's happening mode and let him be a little more silly. And Carl said, yeah, let's just play with it, make me goofy here. And that's, that's what I think we want with this scene. And so those are kind of the moments that, that stand out the most for me. Um, yeah, we've already talked about some of these great moments in the series, but one that was kind of unique for me was the last episode. Um, and we've already kind of mentioned that you know, sometimes you're, you're given a little bit of source material very shortly before we go into record. So the, the last episode, and I usually try not to watch too much of the original Japanese if I'm working on an anime series, and I'm just trying to get the gist, but not too much, where now you're, you're trying to copy a performance or mimic something. Um, but that last episode, I was very nervous about, and it was mostly the laugh. I knew the laugh was coming, and I knew that I was going to be scrutinized and judged for my laughter for the rest of the time. So I watched the original Japanese episode probably four or five times. And I wanted to be so familiar with the original Japanese voice actor's laugh that I could, you know, hopefully do it justice, but kind of justice, but kind of also do my own thing with it. And that's, that's kind of what I did. But I was a huge pain in the butt in that last session, partly because I was way too over prepared. I had made my own rewrites. I had, I was, you know, now working on now clocks and all that kind of stuff. And I also kind of begged them to let me re-record things over and over again. So the laugh I recorded once they were happy with it. All right, bro, let's move on. I just tried again, and I probably did it four or five times because I just didn't want to show it again. So it was difficult, but I think at the same time they kind of appreciated just the, uh, the level of commitment. And for me, it was free therapy. I got out of there exhausted and content. You know? Some of the voices that were delivering my head was kind of gone away. You know, I did a little bit of, uh, uh, good,
to do a, a short piece about it. They chose Death Note, the anime that they were going to do. And, uh, uh, you know, I thought it was great, but we were going to do it stuff in minutes or how long it was. But um, it, was, it, was, it was fabulous to see that those artists and those writers and performers wanted to do a takeoff on, on this series, which we love so much. And they, they made a lot of respect to it at the same time, where they actually ship it out to a different animation house because they wanted to have a certain look. And just the fact they captured all the characters so well and, and you know, get a good little homage to the story and whatnot. And for me, it was so exciting that this wasn't done back in 2008 or 2010 even. The fact that it was done now and it was still relevant to so many people really shows that, yes, this, this show is something special and we're fortunate to have it in our world. And since it's now in this, it added it to their world too, so very cool. It's always wonderful when a show that you love so much, uh, when you become aware that the creators and people who are going to show are aware of your work too. Yeah, that's just a great, great thing. Yeah. I feel like uh, for like short yeah. fans that like uh, a treehouse episode is kind of like people getting a weird house song. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 It's kind of like Oma's parody. It's a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah. That's your question. By the way. Get close to the mic. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm William. I'm uh, my first uh, series anime <laughs> was definitely my sister's a super fan. I was like a brother of it, you know, so. Um, uh, but my question, because I forgot my other question I had planned, is uh, what other anime do you uh, think, or besides Death Note, in or besides ones that you worked on? Like, uh, the question was, what other anime are we into? Yeah, what other anime do you think are good besides what we've worked on? Yeah. Um, only what I've worked on is good. Everything is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love Tapa Titan. I think it's good. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the ones that I would watch. Time to come to anime, like all of you guys, but that's one that I kind of get sucked into. When I watch the first couple of episodes, so it's, it's pretty good to make sense. Yeah, I have um, sort of preteen kids, so we've gotten really into the studio movie stuff. It's uh, <laughs> also the castle, and all sort of those. Um, but I mean, I going back, I enjoyed as of my own my own teens, and then later, um, like Princess Mononoke and um, Akira, like going way back. Those are the ones that, that resonated for me when I was a teenager in my 20s um, that I look forward to sharing with them. That's where I was going to go with that. It's the very first you know, Japanese animation that I, that I really saw and see done on my own it was being a bunch of my friends in high school was Akira or Akira before. And I had no idea that animation could look like that and, and you know, address subject matter if it was not cutesy. And, and for kids. You didn't catch us with a sweet speed racer before that? Well, yeah. It was the first one that got released in theaters, as I remember, you know, like, uh, so it was a real. I must all be about my age. This, this is a, a cheat because I did work on the series, but it's one that for a long time was on everybody's list, and it's one of the first, as far as I can tell, one of the first anime series that really became hugely popular in North America. It's a long series called Long Ball What Happened. So afterwards, like, yeah, I was like, what's that? So that's that's why I mentioned it. Uh, we got to kind of have a lot of that. But hey, there we go. But it's, uh, that's the first show that really kind of got me into seeing how anime is embraced in North America. And it was a different time where it was a lot more difficult to get that. So you had to be a super fan uh, because you had to jump through a lot of hoops to get your anime back then. We should try to get through at least a few more questions. So, yeah, I'll yeah, we'll start a lightning round next yeah. couple. Lightning round. round. We've only got a few more minutes before we uh, have to go, but. Yeah, but. Alright, so I understand Jeff Mills can be a good series, but also on the show at times, but how do you feel about your fandom? Just like, I mean, it was 90% of it, it's just a complete humor. So, like, how do you feel about the whole fandom in general? Well, I don't know, just so overwhelmingly grateful and happy about it. I mean, it's, it's incredible. We do these these jobs, these voiceover jobs in particular, 
and we put things out into the world, and we don't necessarily get any feedback from it. Sometimes, you know, someone's nephew or someone's niece will be watching a show, and that's kind of how I find out about it. Not that my kids had a different perspective on it, but to experience this, which is relatively new to me, like I don't think I did three or four conventions for anime ever, um, this is incredible. This is, um, it feels like a wonderful exchange of uh, positivity and, and, and goofiness and fun and all the things. You guys are awesome and beautiful and super talented and we appreciate you so much. I'm sorry, I can't show you guys. Favorite scenes of the worst action during the show? The tennis match for me, for sure. That was big fun, as we said before. Potato chips. Already seen meeting like the first time. Alright, final question. Oh, last one from Elle. Alright, have you guys seen or heard of the death note musical and how do you feel about it? We just became aware of the death note musical very recently, or at least I did. And I saw some clips of it, and it looks awesome. And I think you did a great job. And I'm really thinking about putting together a number in the next song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am so intrigued by it. I think it's so cool that they get it, and it's clearly done to the nines. Like it's not even you know. The songs are great. The songs are great. And we don't know. AJ is a composer, so yeah, you know, well, they're first a brand of singer and musician, and, and, and I'm a groupie, so. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'm so intrigued, and I, I want more, I want to see more of it, I wish it was being done somewhere again. So fun. Thanks for the questions, guys. Um, the rest of you guys, unfortunately, you're the show, right? Yes, but I do have one final surprise for you guys. I'm surprised. So, um, as uh, you guys might not know, outside of doing these uh, sort of panels, I also um, activate and cool paints and print free models. And it become a tradition of mine when I got asked to come out the panel that I make uh, custom models for the group on the panel. What? So I have a couple of goodies to hand out to you guys. Hopefully you guys can see it on the camera there. But what? for L, we have this little L chibi figure. Aww. That's amazing. Thank you. Beautiful. Oh. Yeah. For Wii <laughs> We have this little apple mountain statue. I'm saying these are three, some of the best models I've made. I'm really happy with these. And then finally, we have Light Jagame. Oh, there it is. What, is, what, what are they made of? Uh, they're made kind of resin. So they come out of a pretty French and I. I put in the papers last night in my hotel room at like 3 o'clock in the morning. You get so many questions when you tell me that. Yeah, I'm really going to appreciate your time. And I have a bag of bottles full right here now to you guys for. Oh, thank you again. So, if you have questions, I'm going to ask you. Just come to our table in the main hall and you can ask us there. Yeah, we have a long time to go away today, so come out to us. Thank you, everybody. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great countdown. Alright guys, my camera's about to die, so I will need to put it in another battery and talk to you guys in a minute. Bye bye. Oh, okay, it's a little so, baby. You guys. Um oh, baby. thing is oh, over. We oh, kept, there's a sleeping baby right there. You'll never <laughs> guess what I spotted. Ears. I spotted ears. You see that ears? Your ears here. Her ears. Okay, this guy can move out of my way. Look at look at there's ears, there's kitty ears. Alright, and I got Jackie here with me, so she is going to be my person that is going to let me model these for you. Uh -oh. So she is going to let me model these. Oh. Okay, yeah.
This is the first pair. How did I look? Did you look in the mirror? Oh, these are cute. Those match your outfit one. Yeah, yeah, they really do. These are adorable. I think they're perfect. Perfect for my Visa outfit. Okay, so yes, these are a definite contender. And this is from his front legs. That's possum also. That's possum also. I had to check out this possum. This is a possum. How does a possum look? Weird? No, it's cute. Just doesn't go with that outfit. No, I mean, it doesn't go. I, I know the care if it doesn't go. I just mean it's just something new. I can't for hear my you. Or something new for my collection. Yeah. This is awesome. Oh, it feels different. Feel it. Oh, this is coyote. What is it? It's coyote. Do I touch it? It's creepy. I know, right? This is the coyote. Those look cute, actually. You do? Is that what they do? Oh, wow. I feel like an elf kind of like tackling. Yeah. Future. They look kind of real. <laughs> I know. Those have a good. It's, it's interesting because. How do you feel about them? Honestly, yeah, I love all three. Oh, yeah, those are good. Are you having a terribly hard time to find? Yes. Okay. You want me to take pity on you or make it worse? Uh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> take pity. Yeah, yes. make it worse. That's, That's funny. Yeah. What'd you say? Yeah, see, I don't know which one to get. See that box down there? It's full. I like them all. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Misa. What? What? Do you want to make it worse? How do I make it worse? <laughs> More coyote. Mm. There's really furry coyote. That's me. What is this? Coyote. Coyote? Yep. I like the way the fur lays on their legs. The way it curves around and, and it's flat. So, it's very accommodating. It's the only way a coyote is that what it is? Is that what it is? Because it feels so realistic. It, I said real. it reminds me of that movie, Dr. Monroe. It's the Island of Dr. Monroe. Real how does how does these look? These look better than the other ones. I can't tell you that. I like them all on you. <laughs> really? Well, I just got a, a selfie gum with Brett Twally. Twally? Twally, yes. And it was amazing. I cannot wait to show you, or I am showing you at this very moment in time. And it was amazing. Let me do some fun poses. Oh, look at all those prints. Yes. Hey, look, those are those bags, Jackie, that have the um, blank. Oh, yeah. Well, look at these cool bags. You can put the pins in. It's pretty dope. My microphone fell off while I was taking a photo with him because I was driving on him. It was awesome. You know, I thought those were albums over there. Turns out they're not. Um, they're just photos. <laughs> I wish they were albums. <laughs> what? They do. They, yeah, they I, do. I, I thought they were vinyl. We got some weapons over here. Hey, look at this gun for some board games over here. Oh, the pressure. This one is nice right here. Board games. 
the tan seafarers expansion. Can I look at it? Hi. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Explorers and pirates. I want to ask somebody, like, how do we get into Dungeons and Dragons? But I don't want to sound stupid. <laughs> they got Rick and Morty Dungeons and Dragons. Huh? They got Rick and Morty Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Your sister would love that. Yeah. Maybe we, we can get, like, one of these or something. Do you see anything that says Dungeons and Dragons just after this? So if you don't know what we're doing, we're actually looking to get into Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, those are my lord, but we don't really quite know where to start. And we really like playing board games. So, board of the Rings, what is this? First up, we have Rochelle Yula as Nightcrawler from x -Men. And Taylor makes the hits. In the book that this costume was realism. Uses materials like leather and canvas that would stand a flight. It would stand a flight. Of course, got to be ready to go. And we use the bathroom ones and leather to get into the subject. Very nice. Next up, we have Danielle Abraham as Celeste, an original. Dungeons and Dragons character. This is Dungeons Dragons. This is probably the lady. He's looking for a picture, searching for her lost brother's Celeste travel to land in hopes of finding it. <laughs> Next up, we have Megan Megan Adamski, Playboy Garfield, a Playboy Garfield. <laughs> Drinking Monday is the number three in the middle. After the party was on, the skyrocket, Garfield had to take up some different line of words to us. So he came in and took away the next one. Next up, we're going to have Ruby Jackson. Stephanie Brown, a.k.a. spoiler from the Batman Detective Comics. Oh, his arm is going to away. Next we'll have Hayden Miller as a human from Critical Role. Let's see how the box is going to be. The Captain of the Fire. This is Hayden's first time cosplay. This is Hayden. We're made a month in a month. Features gorgeous resin crystals, handmade detailing, and her mantle features over 2,000 blues, all glued on by hand. <laughs> Next we have Maggie Petacek as Hat Kid from A Hat and Dime. It's been a long, tough ride through space and time, but that kid finally made it to her to have some fun and maybe find some time pieces. At the Gallo Zoo, Grand Rapids, Comic Con. Next up, we have Axel as Night Hunter. <laughs> Next up, we have Randy Morgan as Master Splitter. <laughs> After a long come to face four portals all on his own, down of the year. Ava's obsession with 
is being Disney lore combined with the love of puns inspired this dress. Next up to the stage, we've got Remy Green and Suzuki. Yeah, Suzuki. Suzuki Matsuma. The first school history in honor of Mirror's Gallery Suzuki. Then we'll have Nicole Harris as Cruella de Hill. Born bad, born brilliant, and born to the form. <laughs> they will have Tyler Davis. They will have Lindy Carrero is Ileana Himor. From they will have Evans Pincomb and Deku and Katsuki. We think that we go to the scene and get all over, but we may have even seen a few students. Next we'll have Rachel Crunch as Tony Tony Chapter from One Piece. <laughs> and to spin her cosplay as Tony Tony Chapter from One Piece, sporting her ninja outfit from the one of them. Then we will have Jay. As Wei Wuxian. Say, howdy, y'all. Back from the end, and most definitely not ready to run into the people on boarding boats. <laughs> Next we'll have Evan. Evan Biker as the Wanderer, Spanish Samurai from Light and Limb. Once again, we will begin by the wonder of the world from his own order for using magic in combat. Sonoma. Seeing as his honorable way of battle, he was stripped of his name and title and exiled. To never return. Next up we have Emma Alina as son from Five Nights at Reddings. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready to stay up late and drink good hot dogs. Our heads explode. Just one rule. Keep the lights on. Yeah. Yeah. Next up we have Emma Alina as son from Five Nights at Reddings. Yeah. Before his fall into insanity, he was a cold, he proposed person after afterwards, he <laughs> had a single force on the battlefield. I will never be a memory, he said. 
Next up, we have Myla Monacent as Kitty Noir. Come on down from the Alternate Universe where boys are girls and girls are boys. Andra Agretze uses her miraculous to transform into the fun loving superhero Kitty Noir. Next up, we'll have Amanda Brooks as Tink Girl. Let's not say the only thing that I want are not the boy, sorry, I'm not the bad time story lady. It's 2023. Sorry, I need to push it back. But Tink Girl. <laughs> Next up, we have Rachel Greenhill. Or hit with 18. Okay. As American Dragon. This is one of the time. This is probably an average hit. Uh, she used an, un uh, an equivalent of 15 balls. 15 balls of your heart. Wow. Or 5,450 dollars. To create a backhand drag. Then we have Shelby Motherbird. Ingram <laughs> Cosplay. Helen Bear. Hailing from the Sky World, all the love, and the occasional rival in a round of Smash Bros. It's Ingram Cosplay. <laughs> 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 Then we'll have Zane Vitara as Chu Wang from the Husky and his wife, Kat Chisholm. Woo! Yeah! Go Husky! Slay! The second adjusted adaptation of the Chinese novel over four months and 80 hours were spent on this cosplay. Yeah. Next we'll have Raven. This old black riddle rose heart is from Twisted Wonderland. <laughs> and I'm wrong, I am the law, I have order. Make manifest. <laughs> All who the fighting will lose their heads. Next we have Sydney Giddings as the Raven Queen from Critical Role. <laughs> Next up we have Clinton as Hank Hill. <laughs> Yeah. 
Alright, next up we got uh, some Yu-Gi-Oh! God players. Stick up the high bar and continue with this card. Harry that was getting those who hired the cards representing Kaiba for sporting some of their newest technology. Give it up for Sido Kaiba and Shiki Nishima. Judge's 
choice goes to Rachel Crouch as Tony Tony Chandler from One Piece. There you guys. And I'm going to have a battery space, and these people are taking forever to walk up. Second Judge's Choice Award is going to go to Emma Alina as Sun from Right Back to Freddy. <laughs> Well, I want to apologize about our seats at the cosplay competition. We didn't know it was going to be so bad. We actually thought that they were going to go on stage, so we thought we had awesome seats. We were so excited. And then they decided to step on a X, and <laughs> all you could see was a guy's head and <laughs> some arms, so we really want to apologize about that. But... <sighs> It is over. It is done. And I am going to react to the dead, death, death Note movie with my cousin Jackie. She has volunteered. Yes. Although I have not seen the series yet. Yeah. Yes, she has not. But I'm excited to now after going to the panel. The panel is very engaging. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for traveling along with us on this wonderful journey. So I will see you next video. Any last words, my dear? No, thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, you have an awesome rest of your day. Bye. Hey, you stand to stay to the end of the video. Well, past the end of the video. I want to show you my new ears for the people that actually stayed. <laughs> I got the possum ones. Look at them. How do they look? Uh, my cousin said they didn't look natural because of this pink band. But, you know, I can paint this band. I can paint this, like, this little plastic band. I can paint it, like, brown or black or something. But look at possum. And you want to know, I did get... Okay, I got these ones. Let me show you. Before I end the video, before you click off, look at... I got these ones. Am I wearing these right? I'm freaking. Now, see, I'm looking. I'm looking in the the viewfinder. I should have looked in a mirror. I, so I can remember. This look right? Yeah. Maybe, kind of, sort of, a little bit. <laughs> I got these ones, the coyote, but I didn't get the ones that were like sticking straight up. I can always get them from Run Fest. It's the same lady from the Renaissance Festival, except uh, she is the one sitting in the back making them. But I got these ones. I love them because they're so big and my hair is, you know, jumbo. So my little tiny ones look so freaking small. But I could only afford two pairs. She gave me a deal. She, They're like $50 each. So she gave me a deal and she gave me two for 90 so I wasn't going to splurge and get three. So, you know, I'm, I don't make, I don't, I don't got that much money. So I wasn't going to get, you know, three. <laughs> but those are bunny ears. The black ones that I really wanted, those are bunny. And she always has bunny. She could always make those black ones again. Um, but she said, you know, the possum and the coyote are roadkill. 
so who knows when there's going to be more roadkill. There seems to be common of the coyote around of where she lives, but these were her last pair of, well, she said that they do have, she, she did have some another possum too. But I wanted to show you my ears for the people who wanted to stay. But here you go, my ears. <laughs> Well, I'll show them off in another future video. So, thank you again. Bye.